Hello there. Hi everyone. Yes, this is still Jackson Wheat's channel, don't worry. I'm one of Jackson's behind the scenes script editor slash writers. But today, Jackson is indulging me in letting me make my own video for you all. I prefer to stay anonymous, but for what it's worth, I'm a biologist with a master's degree in evolutionary biology. Today, we're going to be fact-checking a recent video made by Raw Matt on our old friend Stunning for Truth channel about DNA barcoding and his attempt to answer Aaron Ra's phylogeny challenge. I hadn't watched any videos on that channel for months, but a few days ago, in a fit of quarantine-induced boredom, I decided to watch a random one and I was just astonished by how bad it was. You'll see what I mean. The first four minutes or so aren't particularly interesting, just some standard creationist nonsense leading into a simplified but almost passable description of DNA barcoding. In essence, DNA barcoding is a technique used in systematics to identify organisms to a particular species, and has shown decent utility in delineating different species. The idea is that you compare a specific short sequence of DNA between members of the same species, which tend to have very similar sequences, while significant differences exist between species. This might sound quite mundane, something you could do with any sequence, but only certain sequences are suitable for barcoding because they're widely shared between different organisms, consistently have low variation within species, and have much larger variation between species. This means that if you build a database of barcoding sequences for each species, you can compare a new sequence to this database, and if it's very similar to the sequences known to come from a particular species, you know that the animal that the new sequence came from is also a member of that species. A commonly used sequence is a 648 base pair part of the CO1 gene in the mitochondrial DNA, which is shared by all eukaryotic life. You can see where this is going to go, can't you? Raw Matt is latching onto the idea that this technique can be used to delineate differences between created kinds, not just between species. I'll play several clips of the video without jumping in too much, letting Raw Matt make his case, and then at the end, we'll see how it stands up to reality. In 2018, they went testing high numbers of species never before done in history, and the results are now in. By analyzing the barcodes across hundreds of thousands of species, researchers found a telltale sign showing that all animals emerged at the same time as well as humans, and all have clear genetic boundaries from one another. For example, they found that the wolf, fox, jackal, and dogs all have similar low DNA barcoding differences proving they are all related. So a dog and a wolf, though not considered the same species, both had low DNA barcoding gaps, showing that they are related to one another and on a family level, drawing a clear genetic boundary. I'll come back to this study later, but for now I'll just point out that while Raw Matt suggested it looked at dogs, wolves, jackals, and foxes, in reality, as you can see from the title, it only looked at wolves, jackals, and foxes, not dogs. While results also showed that a large DNA barcoding difference gap to all other tested animals that evolution says are related to wolves, like the brown bear, the sea otter, martin, fur seal, and badgers, all were distinctly different, having large barcoding differences. I just want to point out again that this study on the three canid species that he showed on screen a moment ago didn't look at bears, otters, etc., like Romat said. He doesn't actually cite any studies that mention any such analysis. That being said, the general claim that dogs, wolves, jackals and foxes have more similar barcodes to each other than they do to other mammals like bears and otters is trivially true and is precisely what we'd expect according to evolution since canids share a more recent common ancestor with each other than they do with those other mammals. Similarly, all felines are the same as well and showed they were all related, all the way down to the species level. The house cat is related to the lion and the panther, and DNA barcoding shows low gap differences. Note that Raw Matt doesn't actually cite a particular study. He just shows some creationist images on screen about the cat kind. We'll come back to this as well. Even though barcoding is mainly used to identify species, it can also work on the family level as well. Once again, Notice how he just says this without explanation or citation? You'll see why. Because from here on, he'll consistently make claims about particular DNA barcoding results being sufficient to differentiate species into different families. Now, the same was found in all humans. 
as when the human lineage was traced from modern day humans to Neanderthal to Denisovan, results showed low barcoding gap differences, and when compared to the primate family, they showed large gaps, meaning humans taxonomically should be in a different family from primates. Wait, that was a bit of a jump, don't you think? Humans are more similar to Neanderthals and Denisovans than we are to chimpanzees and other primates, therefore we should be in different families? We're already in different genera, why isn't that enough? The CO1 sequence contains a total of 648 base pairs in almost every group tested. Humans, Neanderthal, and Denisovan were just one to four sequences different, very low barcoding differences, proving we are all closely related. So much so that even the bonobo and chimp, which are related distantly, have 58 pairs separated from one another. The heat maps generated demonstrates that primates are completely unrelated to mankind, so distant in fact that our supposed closest chimp ancestor is more than 132 nucleotide sequences separate from us. I don't know where he's getting the figure of 58 nucleotide differences between chimps and bonobos from, but he was kind enough to highlight a section of text below the figure to make it clear where he's getting the figure of over 132 nucleotide differences between humans and chimps. Let's read what he highlighted, shall we? In the case of chimpanzees, n equals 133. Wait, n equals 133? Yes, Rawmat has confused the description of this graph with accounts of the number of differences between numerous and chimpanzees. n equals 133 refers to the number of chimpanzee sequences included in the analysis. It has nothing to do with the number of nucleotide differences. Here you can see for yourself the differences between life using DNA barcoding. Just look how similar butterfly species are to one another, yet how different they are compared to an owl. With CO1 sequencing, we can also see the difference between birds and bees, and relation can be mapped out easily. Well, yes, obviously. Butterflies and owls are very distantly related, as are birds and bees. You don't need DNA barcoding to distinguish them. Large sequence gaps of usually 10 or more place them into an entirely different family. In terms of base pairs, anything under 60 base pairs are related, and over that are a different family. And when we look at specific sequence sites, we also see our supposed closest relative, the chimp, is separated by 60 sites. Related species are usually just a few sites separated, and 10 or more places them into an entirely different family proving we are not related to primates. This is very garbled. He's simultaneously saying that more than 10 nucleotide differences indicates two species are in different families, while less than 60 nucleotide differences indicates they're in the same family. He doesn't provide any citation for these figures, and I can only assume he's plucked them from thin air. At least he managed to correct himself though. Humans and chimps really do differ by about 60 nucleotides, not over 132, as he said before. So not only do we have large base pair gaps, but we also have large sequence gaps, proving we are nowhere near related. I really don't know what distinction he's drawing between sequence gaps and base pair gaps, and I'm not sure he knows either. Just look for yourself at humans compared to a gorilla. As you can tell, nothing alike. Yet, when humans are placed next to Neanderthal and Denisovan, you can easily see the match. Yet, look at the bottom, I added the gorilla. Look how completely different it is. It's not clear to me where Rawmat got those barcode images from. I asked, but received no response. They certainly don't look anything like the images I got when I downloaded the sequences myself. For a start, they seem to be using different color schemes, which makes it extremely difficult to see how they line up, even perceiving the sequences are correct. Again, more on that in a moment. So, let's summarize Rawmat's claims. He says DNA barcoding can be used to separate different created kinds and gives examples where felines have very similar barcodes, canines have very similar barcodes that are distinct from other mammals, and there are clear differences between three distinct kinds of primates. Humans are their own kind, chimpanzees and bonobos are their own kind, and gorillas are their own kind. Nice and neat. Now, let's fact check this, starting with the paper about the three species of canids, wolves, jackals, and foxes. The study actually makes it clear that they're quite distinct. Quote, the mean distance among the three species was 12.32%. Mean divergence between the two genera, Canis and Vulpes, was 16.63%. The CO1 barcoding sequence is 648 base pairs long, 
to 12.32% and 16.63% translates to 80 and 108 nucleotide differences, respectively. In other words, the average difference between the three species is about 80 nucleotides and goes as high as 108 nucleotides. This study was looking at a relatively small number of individuals from Iran and Turkey, so I decided to do the same analysis using a much larger data set from the Barcode of Life data system database. In total, I included complete 648 base pair CA1 barcode sequences from 368 wolves, 7 jackals and 35 foxes. My results approximately confirmed the numbers in the paper. I found about 93 nucleotide differences separating the fox from the two canis species. What about felines? Well, Romat doesn't actually cite any studies to back up his claim, so I decided to perform the analysis myself. I downloaded CA1 barcode sequences for 27 different feline species, including the domestic cats and lion, and then aligned them and clustered them by species. There were about 82 nucleotide differences separating domestic cats and lions. I also repeated the analysis for humans, chimps, and gorillas, but since Roma actually got its numbers from a good source, I wasn't surprised to find that indeed, there are about 60 nucleotide differences between humans and chimps, and about 70 nucleotide differences between humans and gorillas. However, I didn't find 58 nucleotide differences between chimps and bonobos. I found less than half that number, around 23 nucleotide differences. So, Romat didn't do very well, did he? The only numbers he got right were the ones he quoted directly from a reputable source. Could there be a lesson in there somewhere? Oh, and remember when he showed this image comparing the barcodes of humans and gorillas, and I said it looks a bit strange to me? Here's why. When I generate the barcodes myself using CA1 barcode sequences downloaded from the barcode database, the human and gorilla sequences actually look like this. Looks a bit more similar, doesn't it? You decide which image you want to believe, raw mats unsighted, cobbled together image, or the actual sequences straight from the barcode of life data system database. Anyway, back to the numbers. So what do these real numbers of nucleotide differences mean for raw mats conclusions? Well, I'm sure you've noticed by now that cats and lions have more CA1 barcoding differences than humans and chimps do, even more than humans and gorillas. The same goes for the wolf and fox. They're more different to one another in this barcode sequence than humans and chimps are, even more than humans and gorillas are. Here's all the raw numbers from my own analysis of nucleotide differences separating the different species within each family. As you can see, I analyzed data for the entire Featheridae family, the entire Hominidae family, and I went beyond the few canid species in the 2017 paper that Romat cited and actually analyzed data from the whole of Canidae as well. A total of 63 species with complete CA1 barcoding sequences in the database. Using Romat's arbitrary threshold of 60 nucleotide differences being the cutoff between different created kinds, we do indeed see that humans, chimps, gorillas, and orangutans are separate kinds. But using the same threshold, we find that the Canidae family isn't a single kind, but rather at least seven. If we use a threshold just high enough to make the Canidae family a single created kind, we find that the same threshold unites humans, chimps, gorillas, and orangutans into a single created hominid kind. It's exactly the same story with Felidae. Romat shows these images on screen from Answers in Genesis, suggesting he believes Felidae represents a single created cat kind. But using his threshold of 60 nucleotides, Felidae is actually composed of at least 13 different kinds. A threshold of 118 nucleotide differences is required to unite Felidae into a single cat kind, but this same threshold also easily unites humans, chimps, gorillas, and orangutans into the same kind, as before. To give a couple of more specific examples, the swift fox and the fennec fox have significantly more CA1 nucleotide differences than humans and chimps, as do the domestic cats and the fishing cats. The arbitrary threshold of 60 nucleotide differences leads to contradictions too. For example, consider the lion, tiger, and jaguar. The lion and tiger appear to be the same kind. The lion and jaguar appear to be the same kind. But the tiger and jaguar appear to be different kinds. How is that supposed to work? It seems that raw mat only has two options. Declare that the canid and felid families aren't individually created kinds, but are instead composed of multiple separate kinds. For example, the wolf kind, fox kind, leopard kind, and panther kind, among others or he take the view that humans, chimps, gorillas, and orangutans are all in the same hominid kind. I can't really see either of those happening, to be honest. This is the whole point of the phylogeny challenge. It's impossible to draw objective lines of separation between groups of species in such a way that a creationist would accept those groups as originally created kinds. 
If you accept all canids and all felids are related on the basis of CO1 barcoding, and then you follow the same rules, you have to accept that humans, chimps, gorillas, and orangutans are related. If you reject humans, chimps, gorillas, and orangutans being related on the basis of CO1 barcoding, then you also have to reject that all canids and all felids are related. After making his point about barcoding, Rawmat mentions another line of evidence that he thinks proves the existence of distinct kinds around the family level. Now, combine DNA barcoding with taxonomically restrictive orphan genes, which show which animals aligned with one another on a family level. Here, Rawmat claims taxonomically restricted orphan genes show some kind of family level specific pattern, but that's not true either. The very Wikipedia article he shows on screen says, quote, Orphans are usually considered unique to a very narrow taxon, generally a species, end quote. Orphan genes are generally considered to be unique to a single species, but there are also genus-specific genes, family-specific genes, order-specific genes, and so on. There are all different types of taxonomically restricted genes existing at all levels of taxonomic classification. They're not unique to the family level or anything recognizable as the kind level, as Rawmat seems to think. That's about it for Rawmat's video, but I just want to leave you with a couple of final beautiful examples of his scientific ineptitude. In the middle of his discussion about DNA barcoding, he says this. When done with humans, primates, and birds, even birds were closer in mtDNA sequence to us than primates. Unfortunately, Rawmat doesn't clearly show the graph he's referring to to his audience. The entire x-axis label is missing for a start. Here's the full graph from this 2016 paper. On the x-axis is population size, and on the y-axis is the average percentage of pairwise differences within each species. So each of the blue dots represents a different bird species, while the three white squares represent humans, chimps, and bonobos. Chimps and bonobos are more to the left of the graph than humans because they have much smaller population sizes, and they're higher on the graph than humans because they have more genetic diversity in the CO1 barcode sequence within their species. Birds are, quote, in between, in the sense that their population sizes generally are intermediate between chimps, bonobos, and humans, and they have a genetic diversity within each species that is also generally intermediate. For example, the bird species highlighted by the red circle has a population size of about 10 million individuals, and about 0.6% of the CO1 barcode sequence is different between individuals of that species. This is compared to us humans, with a population size approaching 10 billion, and about 0.1% difference between any two human barcode sequences. Let's remind ourselves what Rawmat said the graph showed. When done with humans, primates, and birds, even birds were closer in mtDNA sequence to us than primates. I hope it's now clear to everyone that this graph has absolutely nothing to do with comparing the number of differences between the barcode sequences of humans, chimps, bonobos, and birds. It certainly doesn't show that the CO1 barcode sequences of birds are more similar to the human sequence than the chimp and bonobo sequences are. How anyone could look at the graph and come to that conclusion is just beyond me, but this is the typical level of scientific ability I think we've all come to expect from creationists. Another perfect example is in this other recent video by Raw Mats on Standing for Truth channel. I decided to watch it since it was just two minutes long, and his inability to read and understand very simple sentences is on full display again. The whole video is full of errors, like suggesting the GDX11L2 gene Jeffrey Tompkins likes to pretend is highly functional, is present in the centromere of chromosome 2, when in reality it's nowhere near it, but I'll focus on the main claim made in the video. Other biased critics who won't let go of their dying theory, like Jackson Wheat, in his attempt to falsify Tompkins, Jackson Wheat strawmans him and then goes on to explain how a gene can arise and move over a fusion site. He then points to a 2017 study, which Jackson states a gene formed over the fusion site. If you read the paper, it directly states that the new gene went through relocalization after it formed, meaning it arose and then moved over the fusion site. Let's read the sentence for all Matt highlighted from the abstract of the paper Jackson cited. Quote, Detailed genetic analysis of one gene fusion shows that the mutant phenotype is caused by relocalization of the diagonalate cyclase domain to the cell membrane. Now, even if you don't entirely understand the sentence, does anyone think that it sounds like it's saying that the gene itself was relocalized? Or is it saying that the mutant phenotype was caused by an enzyme domain being relocalized to the cell membrane? Sure enough, if you actually do read the paper, you find that it's clearly talking about a new gene forming from the fusion of two pre-existing genes as shown in this figure. The relocalization it talks about 
is the protein product of that fusion gene being moved from the cytoplasm to the cell membrane. If Romack did read the paper, then it's clear he doesn't have a clue how to interpret it, even though it's well written and entirely clear. All of this is lost on the adoring creationist viewers of these videos though. They're also very impressed by how jolly scientific the videos are. When your primary audience doesn't know any better, it's easy to see why Raw Matt and Standing for Truth put so little effort into getting things right. As long as they can keep pumping out videos with a scientific veneer, 44 videos in the last month alone, they can get the same praise from the same small group of fans. I was planning to end the video here, but then there was another twist at the last minute, just before I finalized the script. I'll give you the background and timeline. The original video was uploaded on the 28th of March. I came across it a few hours later, but still on the 28th. I made a few comments under it starting on the 29th, asking some questions and implying that there were some serious mistakes, but still being quite coy so as not to spoil the surprise when I released this video. On the 30th, an updated version of the video was released, which was pretty much the same, except it included an additional 10 minutes or so tacked on to the end about a bunch of different subjects. Around the same time, in the comment section of the original video, I was getting more explicit about one mistake in particular, the claim relating to the Canid barcoding paper. But then on the 31st, I noticed that the segment where all Matt makes the claims about the Canids had been deleted from both the original and the updated video. That's something you can do on YouTube. You can trim videos that you've already uploaded. It's completely disappeared from the record, as though we never said it. Take a look at the original and the edited version of the first video, side by side. By analyzing the barcodes across hundreds of thousands of species, researchers found a telltale sign showing that all animals emerge at the same time, as well as humans, and all have clear genetic boundaries from one another. For example, they found that the wolf, fox, jackal, and dogs all have similar low DNA barcoding differences, proving they are all related. So a dog and a wolf, though not considered the same species, both had low DNA barcoding gaps, showing that they are related to one another and on a family level, drawing a clear genetic boundary. While results also showed that a large DNA barcoding difference gap to all other tested animals that evolution says are related to wolves, like the brown bear, the seawater, martin, fur seal, and badgers, all were distinctly different, having large barcoding differences. Similarly, all field lines were the same as well, and showed they were all related all the way down to the species level. The house cat is related to the lion and the panther, and DNA barcoding shows low gap differences. There's no notes in the comments section or the descriptions mentioning the change at all. My comments mentioning the errors have also been hidden. Hundreds of people had already watched the videos by that point, many of whom would have come away from them thinking the claim is true, and that will stick with them. This isn't the first time Standing for Truth and Raw Matt have been caught doing this when they've been called out on errors in their videos. We can contrast this shady method of editing one's mistakes out of history with YouTubers like Tony Reid, who releases entire videos dedicated to listing all the mistakes he made in previous videos or to the common practice of adding notes in comment sections or the description box, correcting errors. The contrast between dishonest creationists and honest science YouTubers is night and day. Anyway, I hope you all enjoyed this video. Back to your regularly scheduled program with Jackson next time.